Hi, I'm Colleen Whitford with Studio B Art Party, and today I thought that I would bring you a video and teach you how to clean greenware. Um, you can pick up greenware at any traditional ceramic studio that does their own pouring and firing. So I'm going to go over any of the tools that we would utilize. Um, when I am cleaning greenware, I like to use a scraping tool, and it has kind of an arched end on one side and a sharp scraping tool on the other side. I like a spoolie or a spiral tool and that's just really good for getting into all of those little nooks and crannies. I also use this type of detail brush. Um, they use this for scraffito and clay lift and I call it a ditch digger because it looks like a little tiny shovel on the end um, but it puts really nice um, well-rounded um, etching back into a piece when you're doing detail. I also have a couple of sanders that I like and they are all different grits, kind of like sandpaper. Um, I use one of these. Um, they come in white, green, and brown for different grits. Um, this one's pretty scratchy what I, and I really like it because it's nice and bendable around all of the little arches. I also like the sander and again has the white and the brown for different um, densities that you would use all around um, the piece. And then I use this, um, it's a sponge on one side and a really nice fine grit sander on the other. Um, people use this a lot for porcelain because it's really fine and it's great for the areas that are gonna be um, no detail, um, so you don't want any of those scratch marks. I also use a sponge and a little bit of water just to get rid of my dust. I like to have a towel down, but I also put a piece of paper down on top of that. That way any of my shavings get right onto there. In case I do have any cracks, um, stress cracks, or any repairs that I have to do later, I'll actually uh, save those shavings so that way I can go ahead and repair any broken pieces. Hopefully not, but just in case. Um, so one of the things that's really important when you're starting with greenware is making sure that you have really good um, quality greenware, somebody who knows what they're doing when they're pouring. Um, you want to make sure that your greenware is probably about one eighth to one quarter inch thick. Um, you don't want anything that's too thin because of course when you're trying to scrape you're going to put your fingers right through it. So let me see if you can see that that's a pretty decent um, you know, thickness there. The other thing is, is these are like fettle lines. This is where we actually pour the mold. Um, you can see that on this one, there's actually a little hole in there. I don't know if you can see. I know you can see from this side. Um, so that's where I will be utilizing some of the excess greenware dust that falls off that I can actually make and repair that. Um, and I'll have separate videos for how to repair broken pieces and things like that too. Um, so I'll start off with some of the different tips um, that I do when I am cleaning greenware. So first off, when I'm cleaning greenware, I like to start with my um, arched tool or my curved tool. And what's very important is the hand that you're actually holding your greenware in, you don't want to squeeze. I know that seems very, very simple to remember, but we get so focused on the scraping that we have a tendency to forget about it. The other thing is, is if it's like a little figurine piece like this, we really don't want to lay it down and scrape. We want to hold it really gently in our hand. Um, so if I'm in my studio, I'm actually walking around the table and I'm watching people clean greenware and I'm actually looking to see um, if their fingers are turning colors. Because if they are, you can see if somebody is actually squeezing too hard on their greenware. Okay, and I'm going, remember, lift up. You don't want to press too hard. So I'm just going to start, and I'm going to scrape. Now, it's better not to gouge really tight like this. You're actually just going to go over it several times, and you're going to work against these seams. And you're going to scrape kind of on a cross motion because you only want to pick up anything that's raised. You don't want to dig into um, like a gully on the piece. And then if you have an area that's coming around a corner here and you need to get in, you can always change to the other side of the tool. Now you can see there, I was kind of getting in a little bit deeper than I really wanted to, but I'll be able to sand it 
that out. So again, I'm just going to scrape back over to my curved side and I'm going to get in here. Now anywhere where my piece meets and I'm going to need definition, um, I can go back with another tool um, because this one is going to create a line and I want to make sure that you can see this. This one's going to create look how straight that line is and how deep that line is and it's very very definite. If I use and let me scrape this down a little bit more. If I go to something like my little ditch digger tool and I put this, it's rounded and it just looks a little bit more natural. It's not so stark. So that's why I like that one as opposed to this. Can you see the difference in that? I'm going to keep scraping and again better to go over it two or three times than it is to just gouge that out. See all my dust that's fallen on my paper? Again going to use that to fill that little hole later. And when I'm in a studio I kind of look over the pieces before I'm um, you know selecting it off of the shelf because I don't want to have to be spending a lot of time repairing or um, any dents that were in a piece. You know, sanding out, trying to put detail back in to make it look, um, you know, make it look perfect. We want this to look better than store-bought. That's the way that I, you know, want to give a gift or if I'm selling this piece or if I'm cleaning the greenware um, for sale as bisque on my shelf, I want to make sure that it looks quality. The benefit to offering greenware in your studio is that most greenware is going to have more details than what commercial bisque is. Um, commercial bisque usually just has very clean lines, um, it doesn't have the detail, and it's used mostly for glazing. But there's so many other techniques that you can use when you have more detail on a piece. And in all of my videos that I do, I'll be teaching all of those different techniques that are starting to kind of die out as we have glaze-only studios. And you can make a lot of money without even having a kiln. And I will show you how to do that. I've been in this business a very long time and there's so many people that are looking for good quality studios, whether you're offering, you know, greenware and bisque, classes, or just bisque. They are looking for, you know, good party ideas and just having a good time. But they just want the knowledge of how to paint. Alright, so that looks pretty good there. Now I'm going to start going back up and around this one here. So this is also a pet peeve of mine. If somebody writes the price on their greenware, one, I always prefer to write it on the bottom just in case they write it when it's wet and you end up having lines that are left in there. Now this person didn't write it in there very deep, so that's good. But before you take it in to have it fired, make sure that you sand that off because you never know if that's going to leave a mark and then all of a sudden you're going to have this $3 uh, being left on there. So you want to make sure that you sand that off just so that it doesn't end up um, being left in there after the firing and then when you're painting, someone's going to know that that's how much it was. So again, always make sure, check yourself several times, you don't want to squeeze with that hand that you're holding. And I'm just going against the grooves and hitting all of the raised areas. If we don't get those raised areas, when we fire, what's going to happen is um, that's actually going to raise in the firing. And then when you go to paint, that's going to be highlighted. It's going to end up being raised on your finished piece. Now after I go around it one time, 
I actually turn it the opposite way so that I can see if there's any other areas that I need to scrape. It's better to scrape this twice than to have to sand more because one, it's gonna eat up your uh, sanding tools and it's gonna make your work harder. And I'm kind of a work smarter, not harder kind of person. So I'm just gonna scrape around one more time and kind of get it from the other angle. And just making sure that I'm getting all those raised edges. And from this other angle, I can actually see quite a bit that I've missed. And always have good lighting. That should actually be one of the tips that I have there. Good lighting. Um, I will always, too, before I take it in to have it fired, I recheck it just to be sure. Okay, so then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take my spoolie tool. And my spoolie tool is going to go around and it's going to get all of those areas that need the definition, um, basically any contact points. And again, make sure that you're not squeezing with that one hand. You'll hear me say it a million times. Um, I like this smaller area just because it's a little bit easier. And I just go over it a couple times, back and forth. You don't want to press really hard. And you definitely don't want to go over it a lot to where it's um, starting to create a little ditch or a river. Now this one here is a little bit of a wider space, so I am going to use the bigger side. And I'm going to kind of move it not only back and forth, but kind of up and down, forward, back, um, just so that, again, it doesn't create that little valley. Going through here. And just get all my little contact points. And I'll turn them this way. When I'm doing this, I'm also looking to see if there's any other imperfections on him. You know, sometimes um, fingernails can go through a piece when you're actually pulling it out of the mold. Um, sponge marks, uh, little pieces of clay that may have gotten on there, little drips. Um, so I'm also checking that. I want to make sure that all of that is off of there as well. We want to make this piece look as perfect as possible. And I'm being real careful around that spot that had the hole because I don't want to sand around it too much um, and put a bigger hole in there, okay? And then again, just kind of on the tip. And then once I got all those contact points, I'm gonna go back in with my sander. Now, it's important to kind of go in a circular motion because every time we're sanding, we're hitting just the tips. Um, we just wanna take off that rough edge and we don't wanna create any valleys. Now, these sanders are gonna leave just a little bit of a scratchy mark in there. And that's why each time we kind of change which one we go to, so that way it'll get rid of those scratches. So greenware is actually just dried clay, okay? Once we take it out of the mold, um, it gets to that leather hard stage where all of the liquid leaves, and then it gets dried. So if you ever remember playing in your yard as a kid with making mud pies and those mud pies dry out in the sun and then that um, mud and dirt just crumbles, that's exactly what this is, okay? So that's how brittle it is. So that's why we wanna be really, really careful. Um, in my studio, what I'll do is when somebody is getting ready to clean greenware, I don't wanna scare them but I want them to understand just how fragile this can actually be. So I will actually take a piece of broken greenware and hand it to them and say, okay, break it. And I want them to see how fragile it is. And then they're a little bit more aware of how much pressure they can put on it. I have a little imperfection right there. Um, so I just wanna go over that. It's kind of a ding. It's probably from when they um, took it out of the mold, it probably hit. It wasn't brought like straight out. 
And when I say this, it's not, um, you know, to judge or put any shade on the person who's pulling it out of the mold. Um, a lot of these molds, as you get bigger in pieces, um, are very, very heavy, and it takes a lot of hard work to do these. This is just normal stuff that happens in the casting process. So to make this flat, I'm just pressing my hand up against it and going really lightly in a circular motion, and that just gives me a flat surface. Um, you can also put this flat on the table and kind of go in a circular motion too, just to make sure that it's not gonna rock back and forth. And then we'll go back around on this side. If you ever have the opportunity um, to see somebody do pouring of molds, it's really an interesting um, process. I will have um, some videos up at a later date that will show how to actually cast a mold. And it's so interesting just to see how clay um, is in its liquid form and all the different things that you can do with attaching a mold and creating that form. Again, keeping an eye on the pressure. Always trying to sand in a circular motion. Now, if you ever, and I don't see one in here, but if you're ever sanding and you see kind of a darker spot come up and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, that's called a hot spot. And if I ever see one come up when I'm doing a video, I'll make sure that I go over it. Um, but that's called a hot spot. And that's actually the first place that liquid hits the mold. Um, and it can be very hard to cover when you're actually painting. Um, so the idea is to keep sanding it until it goes away, but you also don't want to create a big, huge hole in your piece. There are some things that you can do um, to help eliminate that, and some of it's in pouring and some of it's in cleaning. Um, so at a later date, I'll go over that as well. Okay. And uh, it's always nice to take the little brush, get some of your dust off of here so that way you can see. Um, don't ever blow your dust because, one, it gets all over the place. The person that's sitting by you um, in the studio is not going to be happy. Um, and this dust is just so fine, you really don't want to get it up there. Everybody's got allergies and that sort of thing. So I'm just kind of getting it out of the way. Whoop, another little hole that I'm going to want to. Those are air pockets. Um, this one right here is an air pocket. This one was actually created when um, something touched inside the mold um, when we were fettling and getting that excess um, clay out of there. But this one is just a little air hole um, that got trapped in there. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take this fine sander. And this fine sander I'm going to go back over one more time, and that's going to help get rid of all of this little scratchy um, I know in the video you might not be able to see that, but if you're cleaning greenware, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Before I do that, though, I am going to go ahead and fill this. Um, now, what you can do is if you take a little piece of harder greenware that fell off and you just dip it in a little bit of water. I'm just going to move this over here. You just dip it in a little bit of water and you make it a little bit more pliable in your hand. And what you're gonna do is just stick it right in that hole and then take your little tool with the curve and smoosh it in there. And that's gonna fill that. But then you gotta let that dry. Now on this one, we're gonna do the same thing. We still got a little bit of that left over. This one we have to be a little bit more careful of because it was a hole that went all the way through. So I'm just going to dab that lightly in there, and I'm not going to push it too hard. And then I'll go over that with a brush in a little while um, just to smooth that out. Um, 
And then because if it gets too wet, it's going to create a bigger hole, a bigger hole, and then we're just going to have a mess. So I'm going to start then on this side with my um, fine sander. And I'm just going to go again in a circular motion and get rid of any of those little scratch marks that are in there. Now a lot of people at this point will just use a sponge and water. You don't want to use too much um, water on a piece because some um, stains and glazes aren't going to adhere as well. Um, and you can also uncover some hot spots and things like that. So I only use a little bit to just get rid of the dust. I really don't use a lot of it for cleaning. And I'm just kind of pushing away any of the dust. That looks pretty good. I got one big scratch there. So I'm just going to kind of, again, go against wherever that groove is so that way I'm only hitting the high edges of it. And then I'm going to start up here at the top so I'm away from that section that I filled. Go around his ears. And then just touching up. Now, if this was still a darker uh, gray color, then I wouldn't want to touch it yet because then I would know it's still really wet. But it looked pretty dry. And I'm just checking here. Looks pretty good. Okay. I'm going to go back with my ditch digger. And I'm just going to create some more lines there to create some definition. And now I'm going to put in, this is so important, you have to make it look like there was no seam ever there. So I'm going to put the detail back in. Now it's better again to go over it multiple times than to put in one big gouge. And I'm going to make little hash marks in different directions so that it makes it look natural. And I kind of overlap where the beard already was so that it starts to blend in more. Because depending on the technique that you are doing, if you're going to glaze this, um, you know, the glaze, you want it to seep into the cracks. You don't want it to show up um, and make that more of like a highlighted area. If you're going to dry brush this, which all of these techniques I have um, videos for so that you can learn. But if you're going to dry brush, you need those raised areas to be able to hit and highlight and make it look like it's hair with a nice texture. Now look at that. Look how nice that looks compared to that. And you can start on something small and then you can graduate to something big like a Christmas tree. And again, just making sure that I'm creating some definition. He's got this little mark around his hat. I'm going to extend that just a little bit so it kind of helps camouflage where that seam was around his head. Same with over here. And 
and I'm looking them over again just to make sure I'm not missing maybe a little bit around this ear okay the very last thing that you want to do and every shop owner will absolutely love you if you do this you want to make sure that you put your initials in this okay when we are firing product for people um, there are hundreds if not thousands of pieces that go into a kiln and it's very difficult if 10 people bring in this same gnome so you want to make sure that you put your initials and maybe even the year on here so here I am putting my initials digging it right in there okay and then I'm going to go ahead and dust it off now I always like to use a natural sponge and I wring out all of the water so it's just barely wet sometimes I even dab it um, and then all I'm going to do is just pick up the dust because when you fire if there's still dust on there that dust is going to be in those grooves and then you're going to have to use a bisque sander and then you're going to get those really sharp lines again and we don't want to do that so that's even a little bit more water than I would actually like um, but that was also the area that had that little pinhole so I wanted to make sure I got rid of that and I'm just picking up that dust because again we don't blow it on anybody just going over those lines cleaning it up and I'm just looking them over again to make sure that there's no other imperfections or anything there's a little bit of dust that's kind of inside here so I'm going to use my brush to get that out and that is how you clean greenware so go ahead and comment below if there's anything that you would like to see as far as ceramics goes and if you are watching me on Facebook um, please make sure that you share and like my page and if you are on YouTube, please subscribe and hit the notification bar so that way you'll be able to see all of the other videos that I have. Thanks and have a great day.